Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. This is Sohini from South Bay, California and I welcome you today. So this is the channel where we talk about AI and machine learning models, methods, and use cases. Typically we do talk a lot about computer vision use cases. So today's video is motivated by some of the comments that I've been getting from some of my subscribers. And that is in regards to a, a video that I had posted last year and I will be linking that video right here. And that video was on UNET and UNET is a very powerful convolutional neural network model to do image semantic segmentation. I already have two GitHub uh, repos that are out there that you know use UNET on public data sets, but most of the public data sets or most of the use cases of UNET you will see so far use it for binary semantic segmentation. So if you have an image and you're only interested in getting the foreground versus background, so you have the you know, person, so right now it would be a boundary around me and the background and that's it. But there are cases where you want more classes. So if you really want to detect multi-classes. So in this case, if I had to segment myself, the chair, um, the, the walls, my glasses, so that would be you know, multi-class semantic segmentation. How would you go about using a binary uh, you know, model and then changing it for you know, semantic segmentation for multiple classes? So recently I have actually released a Towards Data Science blog and another code base in order to achieve multi-class semantic segmentation. And today I will be reviewing that with you. And hopefully this helps solve your use cases where you might need multiple classes for semantic segmentation. So if you like the content, please give this a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel. So in this video, we will be looking at UNET, the use of a UNET model, which is a convolutional neural network based model for multi-class semantic segmentation. So, so far, uh, I'll be linking a, a video right here, uh, you know, which was on binary uh, semantic segmentation. But recently, I actually did a blog and it's called Machine Learning Engineers Tutorial to Transfer Learning for, you know, multi-class image segmentation. And I will be linking this blog again. It's towards data science. It's free for viewing to everyone. So I will be linking it in the description box below and also the code base in, in GitHub. It's all freely available and it's working on a public domain data set. So you should be easily able to replicate it for your own uh, your use cases. So I wanted to review uh, this blog here. I think it, it gives a lot of useful information on how to do end to end ML models. And the, it, it gives you the systematic approach as to how to go about using a, a GitHub database uh, and, you know, code base and then, you know, modifying it for your own purposes. So, you know, always remember you need to follow these three guidelines. And, you know, the first one is you, you need to prepare the data in the proper way. Then you need to make considerations about the data model and the processes. And finally, there is the outcomes and the metrics that you want to report. So uh, again, this uh, blog is, is for you to view. Uh, I'll go over the code base uh, today so that you can, can replicate it for your own use cases. So step number one, I wanted to start with what are the requirements for the packages. And in this case, it is TensorFlow 2.0 and up. We will also be using the NumPy and SK image in order to you know, read and write the, the images. And the public domain data set that I'm talking about, it's actually in here all fundus images and again these are the the retinal images and as you see they have pathology which is diabetic retinopathy so they have these red small dots and also they can have these bright lesions so red lesions and bright lesions are the two major kind of lesions that you see in this case there are a lot of them so heart exudates and microaneurysms and uh, you know hemorrhages so if you want to look into the ground truth so what people have done is these are like specialists and what they've done is they've gone into every single image and they have masked out the region that they think corresponds to these lesions so that's why this is going to be semantic segmentation but the problem is there are four different classes so ideally you know unit would work for binary but in this case we want to ensure that it's able to scale for multi-class classification and that is the problem at hand today so the first task that we do in this case is one hot encode the data 
So what we are doing here is instead of looking at it as a four class problem, uh, I, I actually shrunk it to a smaller um, you know, realm and I'm just calling it two different, so three classes essentially. So the first class is bright lesions or the you know, hard exudates and then there are red lesions or the microaneurysms or the red small dots and finally there is the background. Now of course if you want to make it as you know five different classes which is you know hemorrhages, red small dots, hard, hard exudates and soft exudates then you would have a five class problem in that case you would just have to extend this n class to five. Um, the only problem that that it would uh, you know curtail in this in this case is you cannot do an io dot im safe because that expects only a three dimensional input. So in that case, your augmentation would have to happen as a dot py uh, as a dot npy so numpy array. And again, in this in this uh, you know blog, I absolutely mention how to expand it for other classes. So please go through the blog if you want to expand it for more than you know three classes. So this becomes the data set. So, you know, you just saw, you know, grayscale images, but now what I have is the red, all the red small dots or the, you know, microaneurysms, the, the pathologies that have red, you know, outcomes, they, they look reddish in, in nature. So they are, you know, denoted by the red plane. Uh, the green plane is all the bright lesions and the blue is everything which is the background uh, code base. So there are actually three different codes uh, that has been provided. Um, so let me uh, go over the, the code uh, document here first. So here you see there is the one hot encoding that we just talked about. There are two other, uh, you know, uh, you know, IPython notebooks. The first one actually does binary segmentation. So and like I mentioned in the blog as well, always if you are starting from, a, you know, a, a particular GitHub repo, which is already, you know, using binary. So you should binarize your data in order to see there are are no major hurdles in your uh, you know in your classification so look at the predictions and these are the images on top of uh, you know superimposed on top of the original image um, so these would be only the uh, hemorrhages so if I am only uh, trying to look at hemorrhages then these would be the outcomes that I get right so this is you know taking a standard data set and uh, you know replicating that so that's the process so far but what is interesting is now what I use is to modify this for a multi-class problem. So let me show you the major changes that I made. First of all, I actually took the model file and I put it as a separate PY file. And these would be separate, uh, you know, cost functions that I would have, uh, you know, otherwise taken. But in, in our case, because it's multi-class, the major difference that happens between a binary and uh, for the multi-class is that your your final uh, your activation function. If you're using it's a binary uh, you know classification, in that case you should keep it as sigmoid. But as soon as it moves to a multi-class classification, then this should be a softmax because that would ensure that, that you know only you know one of of the many classes is getting selected per pixel. So ensure that whenever you are doing a, a binary, then and this can be sigmoid but then when you're doing multi-class classification then this should be a softmax and along with that uh, you know it, it cannot be binary cross entropy loss anymore so in this case we are using categorical cross entropy loss and again the metric is accuracy or you could also have used the dice coefficient loss that is shown here and you know the dice coefficient um, that that is mentioned right so that's the first consideration so here i'm actually not defining the model anymore but i'm just taking a you know model from the model fun function also you will see that there are two different functions one is model depth 4 and one is model depth 3 and in the blog I actually mention what the differences are so this is the major difference you see for for a model depth 4 you will have four different rungs of encoder and decoder while for model depth 3 you just have three different rungs so ideally model depth 3 is better suited if you have lesser data because it has fewer parameters but model depth 4 has more parameters so you have more data you should then try model depth for. So that's the major difference um, that's going on in this case. So we start the process again. In initially, it's the, the train data generator. Um, there is a way the data has to be packed. And I get this question a lot from a lot of my viewers. How should the data be packed so that, you know, it, it, it's able to run? So my, you know, always my suggestion is create a, a folder where you have train and test. In train, you should have one folder called the images. And then there should be one folder called the ground truth. So this is the GT that you are interested in, right? 
and the, the same way uh, in, in test you should just have the you know the images and if you are doing uh, if you're evaluating then it should have the ground truth in there as well so once you have data in this particular format you just run the whole thing what I will be doing is I will be showing you two different things one is what this data generator is doing here and the second thing is what I will be showing you is how to connect tensor board so that you can actually keep a track of what is going on so let's launch everything and I will show you what I mean right here. So when I say data augmentation, it shows you that 27 images were formed corresponding to one class. And then this is the for the ground truth again, 27 images were formed. And this is just to show you how the augmentation is happening. So in this case, I have allowed the augmentations to zoom in, zoom out, pan and all these, uh, you know, wonderful things. And this number on top, that is just the maximum pixel value of that particular, you know, ground truth image, just to ensure all the images are between the zero to one range. And here you will see this is the way in which the data augmentations are actually getting generated out. And then this is the way in which I, I hook in the, the tensor board and I start looking at what the tensor board is doing. So here you see the tensor board is giving me, uh, you know, this is the performance. And uh, again, as, as the runs are happening, we can actually see uh, what the accuracy is and what the loss function is. Now, there is a uh, some some people actually like to just plot the history. But I like to look at the tensor board and then there is a reason to it. This is because a tensor board can help you look at parallel or, or multiple runs. So in this case, think about it. You've had, I've had, you know, these same runs before. And now I can see how the current run actually performs with regards to the existing runs. Uh, I can definitely see, you know, was it, is it doing similar? If I change some variables, how is the performance? Um, so here it, it gives you a very good gauge that if, you know, you're, you're changing parameters, how off is it with respect to, uh, you know, a previous run? And this way you, you can even find, uh, you know, errors pretty soon. So if the learning rate has to be increased or if the, you know, compiler or the optimizer has to be uh, changed, then this is how you will quickly figure out, well, yeah, um, this is not doing very well. So I would go ahead and do a kernel interrupt. So this is the predictions that I have so far. And again, all of these predictions are already on the on the GitHub uh, you know, code base. So here you see very clearly that the bright lesions are detected separately and then the red lesions are getting detected separately. And this is happening after 100 epochs uh, of uh, up to 20 images that are taken per batch. And it's doing a pretty decent job of detecting the, the red lesions and the bright lesions separately. And like I mentioned, you can definitely, uh, you know, in, in expand it for more classes. So if you have like five classes, you can definitely go about and this is just the way to visualize this and then finally it comes to what are the metrics you want to report and in that case the metrics could be your macro as well as micro precision recall and accuracy so uh, again this was uh, you know requested by some of my viewers that they wanted to see how to expand uh, you know unit to you know multi-class make sure you have a good data set to train on so for instance uh, let me show you what would have happened if i had trained on the whole data set you see the first 27 images actually have pathologies but the rest they are almost blank so in this case if i had used all of the images to train then you would have seen that most of the of, of the pixels would have actually be started getting detected as a as a background so you will get you know white whitewashed outcomes and i'm hoping this blog and i'm hoping this uh, you know code base uh, that i have created for you all is able to help you <music>